Welcome to our service of worship at John Knox Church. Welcome to those watching live or listening to a recording of the service. And of course, welcome to everyone, especially any visitors who may be here in church today. Do please stay with us and join us after the service for a cuppa and a chat through in the hall. Our minister, Gavin Niven, is finishing a short holiday, so we are delighted to welcome back Reverend David McAdam from Bethany Christian Church, who will lead us in worship today. Welcome to you, David. Let me now give the headlines about a few of our notices. More information on all notices can be found in the weekly notice sheet, which is available in paper copy here in the church and also available online on the church website. Cashaw, whose contact details are in the notice sheet, is providing pastoral cover while our minister is on holiday. This Tuesday is the Guild's closing meeting, so also the AGM and Bring and Buy sale. An online pioneer course starts on Wednesday, and our next Forest Church is next Sunday afternoon. Some church members are among this year's 400 strong praise gathering choir. There's still time to join them by registering online before tomorrow's first rehearsal. Now, we have uh, an assistance service dog in training with us today. Please, if you're in church, do not pet or approach the dog. By all means, speak to its handler, but please, uh, no, no petting uh, the dog. Thank you. Now, a final notice is not in print. It's about um, Holiday Club, which is from the 29th of July until the 2nd of August in the mornings. We need a team of people to help at Holiday Club. There are many different roles. The recruitment process for working with children takes up to eight weeks, so please don't delay. If you can help, please volunteer. Now, you can either chat with Linda, who's here, um, or Christina, who's uh, over here, or you could email Alison Niven. So, again, please take time to look through the entire notice sheet. There are many, many bits of information there for you. But can I now invite Reverend Dave McAdam to call us to worship? Thanks, John. It's lovely to be back with you and uh, to join in worship with you, with you this morning. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all His ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is He. The band will lead us in our opening songs of praise. Good morning. We have two songs back to back this morning to concentrate our minds on our worship of our God today. So please be ready for that, but also don't feel you have to stand all the way through. You can stand, sit, sit, stand, whatever you feel you would like to and are able to do throughout those two songs. We have Light of the World which is what Jesus is. And then we're just going to praise him, or praise his name. So if you are able and would like to, feel free to stand.
Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. And Joseph stood the entrance sealed by heavy stone. you are our God. You are our Lord. You came for us. You died for us. You rose again that we might have your power within us. And we thank you this morning. And we want to praise you as best we can. We want to give you our praise, our thanks, and our love this morning as best we can. So Holy Spirit, come and help us in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wonder how many of you have got into the habit of doing a daily puzzle. Yes. What's your favorite daily puzzle? Sudoku. Sudoku. I can't even say it. Never mind, get it right. I never remember if the U comes before the O or the O comes before the U. Anyone into a Wordle? Wordle over here, okay. 
What's the other one on the go? Connect, oh, connect, connect, something. I don't, my wife does them all. She does them all before breakfast. So I thought, uh, and she swaps all the ideas and uh, anyway, it gives me peace for half an hour. <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's a puzzle. Let's see if you can do this one. One plus one. Do you know what one plus one equals? Can you answer that one? Two. Two. Well done. Fantastic. Good. Here's a harder one. Are you ready? One plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one one equals... How many? Eh? Can you see them? Did you get that yourself? Well done. Well done. I couldn't even count that number. A eh? seven. Jesus once had a very puzzling question. I think he liked puzzles, actually, because he quite often asked questions that were hard uh, to work out, and people had to put their thinking caps on. And this particular day, his question was, if my brother or my sister upsets me, how many times have I to forgive them? How many times have I to let them say sorry and carry on? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Four? Five? Six? Seven? Nine. (laughs) That's a good number. (laughs) During lockdown, uh, a family that my wife works with, uh, where there's a a seven-year-old and a five-year-old and a two-year-old. Uh, and they were shut in their house for three weeks in a row in the top of a tower block. One day, the mum found the seven-year-old and the five-year-old googling on the phone under the stairs, can you sell your baby brother? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know that they, I think they'd got to nine and thought that was enough times. Eh? Well, Jesus actually said, can you do this number? 70 times 7. Not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, but 70 times 7. Oh, I can't do that number. Can you do it? (laughs) No, I don't think so, because I don't think Jesus was really looking for the answer. I think he was saying, the number of times you have to forgive your brother or your sister is so many, we can't even count it. It's so many, you can't even count it. Because if you try to count how many times God forgives you, even in one day, it's so many. Do you know, one of my favorite pictures in the Bible is of Jesus as a shepherd. And that's because when I was young like you, that's what I fancied being. I thought one day I would be a shepherd and uh, I wasn't very good at it. So after a week working on a farm, I was told, on your way, son, you'll never make a shepherd. Eh? I crashed the tractor on the first day. (laughs) But I love it. And uh, my brothers in Ireland, my brother-in-laws are both shepherds, and I love going over for a week and uh, pretending I'm a shepherd. I can bring the sheep in, I can count the sheep, I can uh, bring the cows in. That's not a shepherd, is it? I can milk the cows and I can pretend. But our two dogs on the farm in Ireland are called Mist and Mercy. Mist and Mercy. And they're a great pair because uh, however far the sheep have gone, however late they are for their lunch, however slow they are coming, you can just shout on mist and mercy and they'll go and bring the sheep in however much they've got stuck. And you know that an old, old, old Scottish 
a pastor once said that God has two sheepdogs, and they're not called mist and mercy. They're called goodness and mercy, and they follow us all the time. Isn't that good? That God has two sheepdogs that follow us who are his sheep all the time. And they're not called bark, and they're not called stern, and they're not called judge. They're called goodness and mercy. And it says that in the Psalms, doesn't it? Your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And because God is like that with us, He's coming after us with goodness and mercy. He's asking us also to be like that to each other, goodness and mercy. How many times do I need to accept when people say sorry and start again? Well, goodness and mercy say over and over and over and over again, as God has been to me, so you be to one another. We're going to sing a song uh, that, is it a new one? No? Have you done it before? Oh, in P4, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but uh, if, uh, if MP3 want to take over, that's great. Uh, the golden rule, let's sing it together. Yeah, the reason that we decided to try it as a band was because the MP4, the video version, is very fast and the words come up very fast and it's difficult to follow. So we just thought, right, we'll give it a go and I hope it's okay for us all to do. <laughs> Let's stand, if we're able and feel to, the golden rule. God said to us, the golden rule
okay, it's time now for our young people to go through for crash and trailblazers. Let's pray together. Lord, we bow together in your presence this morning because you are the God who invites us to come to you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. 
We thank you, living God, for these words that we've heard sung that express truths about you to our hearts that we've found to be true. You're the God of invitation, the God of welcome, the God of humility, of gentleness and lowliness. Thank you that you've said in your word, this is your heart, your gentle and lowly in heart. Lord, we can hardly believe that you who rule the stars and the constellations, rule history and rule our lives of such power and majesty are at your very heart gentle and lowly. And this is what you've said to us, and so we worship you. We thank you that uh, in the person of the Lord Jesus, you embodied this reality uh, as you touched lepers, embraced children, ate with sinners, healed the sick, freed the demon possessed, and died in our place for our sins. Our hearts cannot survey how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God, and so we pray for that ministry of the Holy Spirit that we may know more and more the tenderness and strength of your love, the gentleness and lowliness of your heart. We come this morning because you invite us, but we come this morning because we want to confess to you that we've not only been drinking from the stream of your love this week, but we've turned our taste buds elsewhere and tried to find contentment and happiness in other things. Lord, we're sorry that we're so easily distracted from you. We're sorry that we don't make you our uh, first port of call always. We're sorry that we complain to you about the way that you ask us to walk. Lord, have mercy upon us in our sinfulness. Renew a right spirit within us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we gaze on you this morning, transform us from one degree more into your likeness, Lord Jesus. Hear us as we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us to say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <coughs> now we're going to sing again uh, the hymn, May the Mind of Christ My Saviour. And then Alison is going to read to us from Micah chapter 6. <laughs>
Today's reading is from Micah chapter 6, reading from verses 1 to 8. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord's case against Israel. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord, and how down before the exalted God shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but uh, most political parties nowadays like to get their message out in three-word slogans. Have you noticed that? I, I, I don't know whether they think we can only manage three words, but it tends to be that they, they come out with a three-word slogan like, get Brexit done, or build back better, or stop the boats. It's always just three words. I noticed this the other week when I heard a Welsh comedian on the radio saying he was going to stand up at the next election and stand on the policy of clear the plates, clear the plates, so that whatever question he was asked by anybody, what are you going to do for your schools? That's not the main issue, but I can guarantee we will clear the plates, and uh, so on and so forth he went, and uh, it was very amusing. But he kind of made mockery of the fact that you attempt to uh, narrow a, a complex political argument down to three words. But sometimes simple sayings are helpful for us. Sometimes they do get to the nub of the matter. And for all uh, the 66 books in the Bible and the rich uh, theology that's there, and the deep knowledge of God we're invited to, sometimes it helps us just to have some sort of simple guide, a, a north point of where we're going. And these words in Micah chapter 6 is uh, one of my north points, one of my compass guide points. God's told us what the good life is. God has shown you, said our reading, O mortal, or O human being, or O man, or O woman. God has shown us what the good life is, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. This is not goodness by which you persuade God to love you or do you good. This is goodness that flows from knowing already God's work for you, knowing what God's already done to bring you 
into his family and to make you his friend. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, as the Alison was reading to us, the reading started with God saying, I've got a complaint against my people. And, and that's because they were complaining about him. They were saying, oh, you're boring us, God. Oh, it's too heavy for us, God. Can't we do something different? And he's going, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten everything I've done for you? He says, uh, remember how I brought you uh, through some difficult waters out of slavery? Remember all the miracles I did for you in the desert? Remember when I established you in this place? Remember how good I've been to you? Now, in response to that, this is the good life that I did all that for you for. You don't need to be bringing thousands of rams. You don't need to be counting how many jars of oil you've brought. You don't need to be and he lists all the things that they were kind of feeling burdened by. It's not these things that I want. It's you. You in relationship. So simple. Walk humbly with your God. And what God said to his people all those years ago through the prophet Micah, he still says to us, today. This is what spiritual fruitfulness looks like. This is the good life that God has invited you to and called you to. What is the juice of your life? If I was to take a squeeze, you know like an orange squeezer that you do and juice comes out of it, imagine we could do that to each other. We could kind of like rub each other on a juicer what would be the juice that flows out of your life? I suppose in my role eh, now, kind of doing this, I, I, I call it hobby preaching. I do it in my spare time. I get to visit lots of churches. And, eh, well, you see different things in different places. Some places you go, the juice is the quality of the music. It hits you immediately. Sometimes it's the quality of the food at lunchtime. Sometimes it's their place eh, on the high street of the village they're in and eh, the influence they have of, on their community. But here, very simply, Micah says, this is what the life of God in the soul of a person looks like. Walk humbly with God, do justice, love mercy. You know, one of these three-legged stools, I meant to bring one this morning. You know, I've got a little, I've got a little plant stool that's the, the pride and joy of my wife because she made it in a woodwork class once, and it's got three legs. And you know, if one of the legs collapses, the whole thing collapses and what's on it. You must have something like that at home, a three-legged stool, yeah? Well, imagine what this three-word statement about the good life is if you take one of them away. For example, I guess a lot of people in our society today say, oh, I'm right into justice and I'm all for mercy, but I don't really need to worry about that walking humbly with God. Why do we need to bother with the God bit? Well, because your life becomes like an untethered kite that just floats off anywhere. Actually, if you notice it in our society today, when we let go of the God bit, as G.K. Chesterton famously once said, when we stop believing in God, it's not that we believe in nothing. We believe in anything. And uh, we end up arguing about what justice is and how merciful we need to be. We end up in kind of arrogance and pride like Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel who goes about saying, look at this great Babylon I've built by my power, for my glory, for my majesty. And it becomes very self-obsessed and narcissist. But then there, there are some people who 
maybe let go of another of the legs. Oh, they're all for justice, and uh, they're right on with God. But uh, mercy, oh. They're like the elder brother in Jesus' parable. Remember when the younger brother ran away? And uh, then he messed everything up, and when he comes back, uh, the elder brother says, eh, I can't believe you're being so kind to this guy. All these years, I've been, what does he say? Slaving for you. For his dad. Slaving. <laughs> Do you see what happens when you take mercy out of the picture? Uh, you end up with a very miserable life. I've been slaving for you. I thought you were at home enjoying being my son. I thought we were, we were getting on well, working on the farm together. And you said it feels like slavery. That's a great danger, especially for those of us who are religious, that we end up like that. But then other people are into the God bit and the mercy bit, but they're not so strong on the justice thing. We're quite pious, quite charitable, but not really ready for any kind of revolution. <laughs> Remember the, great, the, the person that the Bible calls the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? He was quite honoring of God, good teacher, he says to Jesus. He's, he, he gives a lot of things away. He honors the commandments. But then Jesus says to him, one thing you're lacking Give all your wealth away. Well, that's very revolutionary. <laughs> that's not trickle-down economics from the rich to the poor. That's like turning things upside down so that there's a, a just way. So if you leave out any one of these three, the stool falls over. And you're not enjoying fully the good life that God has called you to and made you for. Walking humbly with God is the fountain from which the other two flows. Think about that phrase for a moment, walking humbly with your God. Well, walking implies progress, doesn't it? You're not standing still. You're doing it humbly. So, you're allowing someone else to lead. You're not taking charge. It's continuous. It's not sporadic. And it's with a very specific person, your God. Not the God of imagination, not the God you've made up, but the God who's named himself and invites you to know him. Walk humbly with your God. Let's think of that as a central idea as we sing together the song, eh, All I Once Held Dear, Built My Life Upon. Eh, knowing you, Jesus, there is no greater thing.
suppose we might wonder why Micah picks out two things, do justice and love mercy. Has he just picked out random two things? Could he have said, do hard work and love laughter? Why did he pick out these two things as well as walking humbly with God? I think it's because they go to the very heart of who God is. These last few weeks, eh, as you've led up to Easter and Holy Week, and as you looked at Jesus, you can't help but see that in that week, He embodies this verse of Micah, the good life. We see Him walking humbly with God. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? Your will, not mine. That's humility. We see Him experiencing the justice of God. Remember on the cross, He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we see him expressing the mercy of God when from the cross he cries, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The extraordinary truth about God is revealed at the cross that he's just and that he's merciful. And at the cross, his mercy triumphs over justice. Do you know, I'm paid in my job, in a sense, to be merciful. My job is to support men and women coming out of prison and to help them to build a new life. So to bring to an end, in a sense, the punishment part of their life and to help them begin again. It's a great privilege to do it. But it does mean that I work with people who've done some terrible atrocities to other people. I am glad. I am glad for the sake of those who are victims of crime that God is just. I could not live with a God who was not just that the harm and hurt we do to other people didn't matter to him. But I could not live with a God who was only just. In fact, I wouldn't be able to stand in the presence of a God who is only just. So the wonderful thing about the cross is that it reveals not only that God is just, that he takes sin seriously and it has consequences, but that he's more than that. He's merciful. He finds a way to be just and forgiving in the cross. Did you know that the only time in the Bible, the Bible says God is rich in anything is in Ephesians chapter 2 when it says he's rich in mercy rich in mercy. That's the only attribute we're told in all of the Bible that God is rich in. Can you imagine someone having a child and saying, oh, the reason I've had a child is that I want someone to discipline. What a strange person that would be. We have a child to love them, to pour out our love on them. Now, sometimes we have to discipline them, and that's part of loving them. And in the same way, God's justice is part of His loving. But it is, as theologians say, His strange work, His heart work is His mercy the thing that gets him up in the morning, the thing that he's overflowing in, the things that he's rich in is his mercy. And so as we're invited to live the good life that God has redeemed us for, we're invited to do justice 
and to love mercy. Do justice. We're not invited to think about justice, but to do it. Practice it. Live it. Act it. And for some of us, that means personal changes. For some of us, it means political changes. For some of us, it means global changes. But doing justice is not an optional extra for us to know the good life that God has called us to. Doing justice is a reflection of God. But we're also called to love mercy. Not just to do mercy, but to love mercy, personally and corporately. I don't know if you watched some of the Darren McGarvey programs recently, but he was looking on one of them at prisons, and he went to Norway, and there are no life sentences in Norway. And he asked the Minister for Justice in Norway why there are no life sentences. And he said, because we are a forgiving nation. What an interesting concept. How can a nation be forgiving? But Norway has that as an aspiration. So we are called to love mercy. Maybe the way to illustrate it is in a story I heard recently of a judge who retired after, uh, I think it was 24 years as a high court judge in Scotland. The very last day of being a judge, she noticed on the, the, the cases that were to be brought before her, the name of a woman who had appeared before her on the very first day she was a judge, 24 years previously. And she'd also appeared a number of times in between. So she asked her staff could we put that lady last on the list of cases for today? And the clerk agreed to it. And so when the lady came before the judge, the judge stood up, she took off her wig, and she took off her robe, and she approached the bench where the woman was standing. True story. She explained to her, the very first time I sat in this seat, you were in front of me. And this is the very last time In fact, I've just retired because I've taken off my wig. And she gave the woman a big hug. And she said, you're due another £60 fine, but I'm going to pay it for you today. Now, go and live your life and don't appear in front of anyone else in this place again. It's quite a story of mercy, isn't it? As the lawyer of the woman said to me, telling me the story, maybe if she'd done that the first time she appeared in front of her 24 years ago, it might have made a difference rather than waiting 24 years. But you get the point, don't you? And how lovely that she found a way of loving mercy as well as doing justice over all those years. Well, walking humbly with God, that's the starting point. Are you doing it daily, progressively, continuously? And as you do that, and as you gaze on Jesus and see in Him both the justice of God and the mercy of God, are you seeking to live for Him by doing justice? But even more than that, by loving mercy. May God help us to live the good life that he's called us to. Our offering will be uplifted and then Fiona will lead our prayers for others.
Let us give thanks for all the many gifts you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for the joy of giving and sharing our gifts with others. Whether it's our money, our time or our talents, we ask you to bless our gifts and let them be used to support and care for your people everywhere. We heard in today's reading, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Lord, as we pray for others, we think of all the very terrible things that we're hearing, seeing and listening to in our daily lives. Internationally, there are war, wars, almost too many to keep track of. The continuing conflicts in Ukraine, Gaza, Israel, many areas of Africa and South America, Iraq, Syria, Haiti. Then there are individual acts of unimaginable violence, such as we've seen most recently in Sydney, but occur in places all across our world often in apparently safe and peaceful areas. Lord, we do not know what drives these heinous acts, but you do, and we ask for your intervention. There are still too many people across our world who don't have clean water, a roof over their head, enough food to eat, or access to medical care. Humans everywhere have the power and the ability to change, and we pray, Lord, for your work in the hearts and minds of those in power and authority. We pray that they would look for a way to resolve conflict, to understand those they think of as their enemy, to look for what they share and have in common rather than looking for difference and demonising it, that they would find a way to show justice, mercy, constant love, and provide food, shelter, medical care, rather than conflict and bombs. We pray for your blessing on all those who work in war-torn areas, who go where there is famine, where there is natural disaster, and to provide care and support. To those who risk their own lives to bring comfort to others, we ask for strength for them to carry on and show your mercy, justice, and love in action. Give every single person the belief and confidence to stand up for what is right whenever they can. Every single one of us can make a difference, even if it's in a very tiny way. Remind us that you're always with us, that you're our conscience and our guide. With you, we can show your justice, mercy and love to everyone we meet. In our own country, we see much poverty, discrimination, anger and bitterness. This has terrible consequences for families, especially children across our land and here in our local community. Lord, we pray for politicians of every party, those in authority and power locally, let them be guided by love, mercy and justice and care for others. We need our leaders and politicians to rise above petty political differences and to do the right thing for the people they represent. We pray for those who work with the poor, the sick and the lonely, the medics, the social workers, carers, teachers and other support workers. For those who work with the unlovable, the outcasts of our society, give them strength and patience and kindness. Let them show your mercy, justice and love for others in action. Lord, we pray for every one of us here to use our many gifts and talents to do your work. Show us every day what little difference we can make to help and support someone near us. Be that tiny voice we hear when we see injustice, discrimination, criminality. Let us speak out in support of the underdog. Let us help others. Show us what we can do. Father God, we pray that we can show constant justice, mercy, love, and live in a humble fellowship with you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, your Son, who you sent to us, who lived and died and rose again, to demonstrate your love for us, so that we might have everlasting life. Amen. Thank you, Fiona. Well, we're uh, at the end of our worship and our concluding hymn is, What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? Let's stand and worship with the band. Please stand if you feel to, and let's declare what gift of grace. Jesus is.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore.